good evening, everyone. It's, it's, it's wonderful for you to be here and to give us an opportunity to talk about our work. Uh, for the benefit of our webcast uh, uh, audience, uh, my name is John Stremlo. I'm the Vice President of the Peace Program. We are here to discuss uh, the Arab Awakening, and I have uh, next to me, and I will start from my far right, uh, three very good friends and dear colleagues. Uh, uh, Harer Balian is the director of our Conflict Resolution Program. Uh, he grew up in Beirut, Lebanon. He was educated in the United States and took his Juris Doctorate at the, uh, in San Francisco at Golden Gate University. Uh, Herrera got himself interested uh, uh, in the fall of the uh, communist empire and the um, transformation going on in Eastern Europe and spent from 91 through the next several years uh, working in all those transitioning areas and doing a lot of election work. So one of the interesting questions tonight is the comparisons between what he lived through then and what we're living through now. Herrera got back last night uh, from an arduous week in Syria, if you can believe. Syria, Jordan, uh, where he had a uh, workshop on uh, Palestinian reconciliation, and of course Egypt. Uh, Herrera and I were saying uh, before we started tonight that uh, it was less, barely a year ago uh, that we were in Tahrir Square together uh, trying to figure out what was happening. So. Uh, I'm, I'm delighted to have Herer here and back safely, even though he's suffering a bit from a cold, but he will soldier on. And right next to uh, 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 Herer is, is uh, our assistant director of, of the democracy program, uh, Avery Davis Roberts. Uh, Avery uh, did her undergraduate uh, education at the University of London and her postgraduate education at the School of Oriental and African Studies uh, at the University of London uh, on, on Arabic. and. Arabic history and regional affairs, as well as human rights law. Uh, Avery has been directing our Democratic Election Standards Project, which I'll be talking about on another occasion. And, uh, and, and yet for this evening, she's just back from uh, a week ago Sunday, no, on Sunday, from uh, uh, Egypt, where she has been trying to get things organized for the upcoming elections. So she will bring to light what's happening in Egypt for us. On, on my immediate right, is uh, Sarah Johnson, uh, also assistant director uh, in the democracy program. Uh, <laughs> Sarah also just got back uh, from North Africa, where um, for relaxation, she <coughs> went to Tunisia, Morocco, did an assessment uh, uh, in Libya of the possibility of an election, and then joined the National Democratic Institute for an assessment mission to Algeria. Um, it, 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 my colleagues work hard. And on top of all that, we're a family-friendly organization, and Sarah should be at a family function up in Portland, Maine tonight, but she's going tomorrow. Uh, I, I don't want to embarrass her, but for those of you who are friends of the Carter Center, and we're so delighted to have you here, uh, you get to know us and you find people are pretty passionate about their work, uh, and that goes for all of my colleagues. And I just am very, very grateful. I tried to get this renamed the Sarah Johnson Chapel, but there wasn't enough support for that. Uh, but for tonight, uh, from my standpoint, it is, because I'm very glad to be able to defer to my colleagues to talk about um, what's happening in a region uh, where, where it has been absolutely tumultuous for the past year, as you all know from reading newspapers. I'd like to say, think in the next 90 minutes we can attempt three things. One, it would be useful for my colleagues to share with all of us their impressions about what is going on. The Carter Center is privileged to sort of be able to do a kind of first draft of history, a little more than what the old newspaper line is about the first draft of history, but cognizant of Arnold Toynbee's famous definition of history as being one damn thing after another. Um, these are early days in whatever is happening in the Arab world. We can't even agree on the nomenclature. Uh, we concluded we didn't want to call it the Arab Spring, since we're now a year into it. Awakening suggests a kind of coming to alertness out of a general sleepiness. That, I'm afraid, is not what's going on. It's alliterative, uh, Arab Awakening. But a more appropriate uh, a title probably would be Arab Uprisings. Uh, Marwan uh, Bishara, the Palestinian Israeli who uh, is a, a senior political correspondent for Al Jazeera, said, if these aren't revolutions, then they're not worth doing. 
and it should be thought of as, Af as, as Arab revolutions, but that begs the question, how far is the change going to be? <coughs> so that's what we'll do for, for, the, for the next uh, 15 or 20 minutes. I'd like to spend some time giving you a flavor of how the Carter Center operates. Um, you are friends and supporters of our work. Uh, the kind of rapid response that we had to undertake when confronted by these changes uh, necessitates us to change our agenda around and find the resources to get out there quickly. Uh, donors who are prepared to support generally the Carter Center give us the most precious uh, detached dollars that allow us to then leverage uh, the kind of bilateral assistance which has been uh, uh, the bulk of our, our resources for doing the Tunis election or the observe the uh, e Egyptian election. Uh, but if you understand sort of how we work and get to know us a little bit better on that front, uh, I, I hope we can persuade you that your continued support for our work really, really is absolutely critical. So we want to give you a little exposure to that. And then finally, the third objective is to brainstorm a little bit together with questions from you and, and, and answers. There's no bad questions, I always used to say as a professor. There are some weak answers, but we'll try our best. Um, just as a personal aside before turning to Herrera, because I'd like him to begin the conversation, I'd like to uh, issue a disclaimer. We are not clairvoyant. Uh, I was in a taxi cab in, in Monrovia, Liberia on, on, uh, on January 14th, uh, 2011, when I heard on the radio that Ben Ali had left Tunisia. And I thought, oh my goodness, something really important is happening. And my first instinct was to send a, 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 an email, which I did, to the director of our democracy program who was in Brussels and say, you know, David, maybe Brussels is a little boring. Maybe you ought to get down to Tunisia. Well, it was almost that quick that uh, my democracy colleagues were seized with this situation. Um, but my second thought was, is this, um, is this another 11-9? Uh, 11-9, uh, I was hosting a group of uh, Soviet policy planners at the State Department when someone handed me a message and said that the wall was breached. So I'd like to turn to my, my, my colleagues, and beginning with Herrera Balian, who's just back, to give a few personal reflections, given his background, given his previous work, on what he thinks is transpiring in a most general way. So Herrera, the floor is yours. Thank you, John. Uh, what we need to do in uh, discussing the Middle East and North Africa is, first of all, come to realize that this is an enormous region we're talking about, inhabited by 390 million people huge region, and with gross domestic, product, uh, uh, gross domestic product per capita differences uh, between $1,500 per year in Yemen, $210,000 per year in Qatar, in a place like Qatar. So let's, let's, let's start with that realization that the Middle East and North Africa are an enormous and vastly different uh, uh, area, geographically and culturally, economically, uh, uh, etc. What Tunisia and Egypt unleashed uh, a little more than a year ago, in January and February uh, last year, was nothing short of a tsunami. A tsunami that started with peaceful demonstrations organized by ordinary people, not much different from the audience here, perhaps a bit different, students, young people, women on the forefront for the first time in the Middle East history, and, and the changes took place both in Tunisia and Egypt in a peaceful way, through non-violent methods. Having been born in Lebanon, and followed the Middle East issues closely uh, ever since my uh, childhood. Changes to me in the Middle East came through wars, violent upheavals, dictators, military uh, generals, um, uh, unsavory political parties, um, uh, etc. And this, for the first time, uh, was Changes came to these two countries for the first time, at least in my experience, and I think through the, in history, through nonviolent methods. 
Now, it would be wrong to assume that there were no preparations done with these young people who spearheaded the movements in Tunisia and Egypt. The revolutions in the, so in the Soviet space, the Ukrainian orange uh, upheavals, the Georgian upheaval, and before then, um, the, um, the Serbian Otpor uh, um, upheaval in the, in the year 2000, all had produced people, young people, not belonging to political parties, who had developed this expertise in nonviolent methods of, of spearheading change. And they, very quietly, for years before the revolution started last year, had been preparing some young people, both in Egypt, in Cairo, and in uh, Tunisia, in the methods that they had learned, and those lessons that they had learned, these people in Cairo and in, uh, in Tunisia, came in handy when it came to their revolution, because they were able to steer this revolution in a peaceful uh, uh, direction. Let Thank me you. stop with that. No, that's, that's, that's a very helpful start, and I'd like to ask um, uh, Sarah to maybe give a little uh, insight into what's been going on in, in, in North Africa, Tunisia in particular, why in 2011, uh, Ben Ali, the, the leader who fled and had been in power for so long, won with 90% of the vote in 2009. Uh, still, these autocrats felt they had to have elections. Tell us, what, what, what do you think sparked the change be, beyond the immolation of the, of the uh, laborer? And, and, and give us a little flavor of how the other North African states are behaving. Sure. Thanks, John. Um, well, first, let me start by saying I, I think in the Tunisia that I know today or that I've visited most frequently over the last year is quite different, in fact, from the Tunisia of, of before. I had visited several times, and each time that I was there in 2003, 2004, I had these big goons following me everywhere. They had blocked email, so you couldn't have access to um, Hotmail at the time and Yahoo Mail were the, the main free email services that you could get, and they had blocked access to those. Um, and it's, you know, the, the atmosphere of everything is just much different. So you go now and it's just much more free. People feel much more free to be commenting on politics and, and things in general. So that, that is a big, it's a big change. Um, in Tunisia, versus some of its neighbors. Um, the revolution happened fairly quickly in terms of the, um, the demonstrations starting in December and slowly building up and Ben Ali leaving very abruptly in January. There's been multiple um, uh, hypotheses as to why he left when he did. Um, the most believable in my mind is that he actually did not think that he was going to leave and not come back. Um, they had convinced, the, the army had given him a plane to deliver his family to Saudi Arabia, and he intended to reboard the plane and come back, and the plane left without him. So that was <laughs> an interesting, I, I, I think he was just as surprised as, as the Tunisians were. Um, and in fact, I, I think the, the, the revolution itself was a surprise to, there were some people who were watching the country and knew that there were small changes taking place, but this was really a, a big difference, uh, or a, a big surprise for most people. Um, and I, I think we can talk a little bit further about that in terms of the social media and the difference between the social media there and in Algeria and, and Libya. Um, but I think social media in Tunisia did play a big part in it, in that it let um, a lot of people know very quickly that they were against the regime and also um, or that, that there were many other people like them against the regime. Um, and then, of course, the, the WikiLeaks that had exposed the Tunisian government and the lack of support that the Tunisian government had in <coughs> Western governments, particularly the United States. So that, that was a... We, we can talk more about that mm -hmm. in a few minutes. Vis-a-vis um, -vis the situation in, in Libya and Algeria, of course, it, it's quite different. Um, in Libya, things are still fairly unstable, and um, the 
it, it of course, also has a very vibrant feel of um, democracy and, and freedom, but there is a, a much more of an unsettled feeling to it, and that the transition is still very much underway, um, and as of yet has been successful. And one of the NTC members told me that they were they felt very lucky because at every point where something good needed to happen, it did, and it went the most ideal way that it could have gone at every single stepping point. So that um, is a, a quite remarkable achievement. And I think they're going to still need a lot of support to keep going and achieve even the progress that Tunisia has achieved. Vis-a-vis mm -hmm. -vis Algeria, the situation there is also quite interesting and a, a bit different in the fact that um, they are trying to do a much more managed transition. The people themselves tend to be more conservative in terms of um, their willingness to go out in the streets and demonstrate and demand change because for such a long time they've, they've essentially been living a transition for 20 years since the 1990s when they tried to open up mm -hmm. and have pluralism in, the, in politics and to have multi-party elections and the Islamists were poised to win and the military um, shut down the, the second round of the elections. So I don't, I don't think anyone in Algeria wants that to happen again in terms of having um, demonstrations that would result in a civil war. And they're much more interested in having a more managed and perhaps slower transition to um, a more democratic way of, of life. So it, each in its own way is, is undergoing a transformation. Libya probably in the most extreme in terms of its revolution and the impact on society and the breakup of the old order, and Algeria at the other extreme of trying to move very slowly. Thank you. Let me bring Avery into this discussion. She's just back from Egypt. All of these countries have been marked during their long periods of autocratic rule, and I don't think there's really been a change of government since Ben Ali took over in 87 in, 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 in Tunisia. So uh, it's, been, it's been very stable because the military has been so central, Avery. We're all watching the newspaper reports out of Egypt. Um, give us a little flavor of, of what you think is going to happen in Egypt, but also the role of the military may be something we could stay with for a few minutes because it's so important, I think, across the region to understand where the guns are going to be. Sure. Uh, thank you, John. I, I don't think anyone knows what's going to happen in Egypt in the coming weeks and months. It's been um, a period of ongoing transition, as, as we all have heard in, in the news reports and as we've seen when we visited. Um, at the beginning of the transition process, uh, the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces, the SCAF, really stepped in to play what many people thought would be a positive role in Egypt's transition. They came in, they supported the people against the Mubarak regime, uh, they were trying to impose some sort of law and order after the police essentially disappeared um, because police stations had been attacked by protesters. The police kind of just disappeared and the, the army stepped in. And this gave, I think, a lot of Egyptians a sense of confidence in, in the military, thinking that the, they really could be sort of uh, caretakers for this transition process. As time has gone on, however, I think Egyptian confidence in the military has dwindled significantly, and we certainly have seen that in the protests that started uh, in the late summer and went through the fall all, all the way through December uh, with the incidents that were very uh, widely known around the world with the woman in the blue bra and, and all of these sort of mass protests against the, the role of, of the military. The military continues to play a very central role in this transition. They are uh, definitely exerting executive power in Egypt um, at the moment. They have agreed that they will step down by June 30th. Um, and so we are now in this process of, of presidential elections, which will be held in May and maybe with a runoff in June. Uh, but the military is very much still there, and they have now called for a constitution to be written before they step down, which is kind of difficult since they are stepping down on June 30th. Um, so I think they've, they've played a positive and a less positive role uh, over the course of the last year. And I think certainly um, they, it'll be interesting to see how they manage to secure their role in Egypt going forward in this transition, how they manage to secure uh, certain privileges that they've enjoyed in Egypt for, for many, many years. They have a completely independent budget with no oversight from a, any civilian. 
They have a lot of economic power based in uh, the, basically the production of basic commodities for Egyptians. So they have a lot that they will like, would like to protect. And so it'll be interesting to see how, how they protect that role in the coming months. The elimination of the, of the 10 candidates that happened for president just recently, that I'm sure everyone is aware of from the newspapers, uh, the military's attitude toward that, and does this bode well for a successful election, or is it a, is it a, is it a warning of more trouble ahead? It's unclear what the military's attitude towards the disqualification of the 10 candidates has been. Um, These the, were done by the judges. Yes. So the elections in Egypt are administered by, by judges, um, and they made these, this decision to disqualify 10 candidates on different grounds. It sort of depended on the candidate, and they, they all had various issues. Um, it's unclear whether the military has determined who their uh, preferred candidate going forward will be. Uh, there are, Egypt is, is a huge rumor mill. There are lots of rumors about who the military prefers, but nobody knows, and they certainly haven't come out and backed anyone. So it's unclear exactly yet what they will be uh, doing in, in that regard. Um, but we will wait and see, I suppose. Well, I hope other colleagues would, uh, would, would join in because the, 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 the states in the, in, in the North African region, as opposed to many of the places the Carter Center does its election work where states are very fragile and chaotic, Sudan, which, which Sarah was very much in, in, involved with, and uh, Congo that I was at recently, states are very fragile. These states are strong, they need, the, but the militaries are not unpopular. But um, Herrera, you've been watching the militaries in this region for a long t time. Sarah, you might have something else to say. And since I don't want to be dominating this conversation, even though I'm the facilitator, let's segue into a little bit about the role th that uh, religion is playing in all of these um, uh, situations. So who would like to? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Before your voice gives out, why don't you? <laughs> I don't think religion had any role in the initial uprisings uh, uh, that started the that we saw Arab uh, revolutions, yeah. Tunisia, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Egypt, uh, Libya, uh, Yemen. Um, Yemen, you start to see some role that Shia uh, Sunni differences play in the north uh, of the country, but that was a secondary uh, even tertiary uh, uh, factor. Where you start, where we started to see religion playing a role was in, is in Syria, really. Um, where a minority sect, a Shia sect, um, has been ruling the country for the last 40 years. Um, but perhaps another way of looking at the Syrian uh, ruling elite is that a family, a single family, has been ruling uh, the country for the past uh, 40 years rather than a minority sect. Nonetheless, the family has been taking advantage of loyal co-religionists and uh, people to, to uh, continue that control. Um, and the majority of the insurgents in Syria today are Sunni uh, uh, Islam. The other minorities in the country, uh, Christians, Druze, uh, and others, have sort of uh, been supporting uh, the ruling uh, family and the ruling uh, regime and the ruling uh, uh, sect, religious uh, sect. This is one place so where religion has played a, a role in um, supporting the regime and also in feeding fears among some of the minorities that if the Sunni took over the country, there would be no place for them in uh, the country. Now, Lebanon has had its history of uh, sectarian uh, uh, wars. What all of this lead me is that one problem that uh, I've seen and that continues, uh, in, to, and I continue to see in the Middle East, is that minorities seem to have no place in any of the Middle Eastern countries. Very little, if any, constitutional protections are afforded to uh, minorities, such as guaranteed representation in parliament, um, 
an ombudsperson system to guarantee their rights and their grievances, to address their grievances. So the way in which minorities see their protection in the Middle East, and this goes across a number of countries, really, is through supporting the ruling regime, whomever that ruling regime may be. Lebanon has a way of protecting minorities which is really perverse, to say the least, and which has caused already two civil wars and all sorts of upheavals in the country. Yes, yes. <laughs> but religion has, does play a role. So just going back to your uh, initial question, uh, do, minority, do uh, religion and minorities play, have religion and minorities played uh, a role in this Arab revolutions that started last year, uh, I'd say a very limited role. Well, this is, this is a, a, a wonderful opportunity for me to ask a really tough question of Avery Davis Roberts, who I, um, <laughs> this is an inside, a little bit inside baseball, but not too much. The Carter Center prides itself on being impartial and holding governments not to any vision that we have of democracy, but that is enshrined in the international covenants, democratic election standards, that these governments voluntarily sign up for even if they don't behave accordance to those values. And protection of minorities is very much a part of international standards. Okay, Avery, are we gonna be able to go in and do a serious uh, election observation in these places with the, what the situation Herrera was describing? It's certainly, I mean, I don't think that you ha <clears throat> have to necessarily uh, feel that just because those rights don't exist, you can't ask people to mm. enforce them. And so one of the things that we try and do as observers is go in and comment specifically on these issues of minority participation. It's an issue now in Egypt. There is very little representation of minorities or women in the parliament. Uh, there were quotas in the past, and those quotas have um, basically been dissolved. And so there's very little representation of minorities, Coptic Christians in particular, and women. And so as we move forward, um, we will be commenting on this. Certainly in the parliamentary elections, we were quite clear um, in our recommendations that these groups of people had to be represented in parliament, that there had to be some space, political space created for them to be part of the process because if the space isn't created, it just won't be there. There has to be a specific effort to allow people to participate. And so uh, we have made those recommendations and we will continue to do so. And uh, Egypt benefits from having quite a vibrant civil society, <clears throat> albeit one that um, has certainly suffered under Mubarak and continues to, to suffer uh, in this transition period. There have been uh, several sort of repressive acts against organizations that promote democracy and human rights, but they are there, they're working, and they will take up these issues after we're gone. So, Thank, well, um, John, if I may yes. add one uh, Please. Uh, thought that uh, I should have uh, mentioned. Uh, there's another area in which religion has played a role. Extremist religious groups, extremist um, uh, Shia or Sunni groups have played a negative role throughout the history of uh, uh, the Middle East, where they've been engaged in violent uh, uh, activities. Now, um, even the Muslim Brotherhood, in its time, in the 20s and 30s and 40s, has, engaged, has been engaged in violent uh, uh, activities. Some of them have evolved and espoused parliamentary democracy and parliamentary uh, uh, systems uh, to pursue uh, uh, their aims. Others uh, have not. I mean, Al-Qaeda is mm -hmm. the prime uh, example, obviously, even though they were not based in the Middle East and mm -hmm. they're based in, uh, in Pakistan, uh, um, uh, Afghanistan area. But there is a as a result of their history, and as a result of extreme, as as a result of the role that extreme Muslim uh, movements and organizations have played uh, a role in just the last 10, 20 years elsewhere. Uh, I think what has happened is that with the Muslim brothers getting the upper hand in a number of countries too, after the Arab revolutions of last year, uh, through the electoral uh, process, whether it's in Egypt, Tunisia, or in uh, uh, Morocco, um, and some other countries where they have not gone through uh, elections. 
there's a fear among um, some of the population, in particular minorities, that their existence in those countries would be threatened should uh, political Islam come to power. Well, Sarah, in, in, to, we're, we're speculating what's going to happen in Egypt and, 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 and Libya, uh, but you've managed the project in Tunisia. Uh, tell us a little bit about what played out there. Does it set a standard for the rest of the region? What do you think? Sure. Um, well, in, in terms of, uh, you know, I, I think the, the one, if I may please. go back a little bit and then please. come to your question. Please, please. Um, you know, I, I think the one role that religion has played in, in terms of uh, across the region in, in the, the revolution is, is that of political Islam. In that um, because many of these authoritarian governments were perceived as being very corrupt, um, and in Tunisia in particular, Ben Ali himself was actually maybe a decade ago fairly well liked, but because his um, second wife was and her family was perceived as, as taking advantage of the position that they held and, um, and being very corrupt, his, his popularity had decreased over mm -hmm. time. Um, but because of that uh, corrupt practices, then there's a, a there, you know, there's one, there, one, there's a, a sort of a, a trend more towards political Islam in that they think that an Islamic party holds higher moral standards and will not be, um, will not take advantage of the population or will not do underhanded business practices or will, you know, will, will govern more justly. Um, and so they get votes from people who might not even be very religious themselves, but think that this party will be a, a, a better um, uh, face for the people or represent the people in a more fair way. Um, and then the other trend that across the region I've seen for quite a while that you know, when I was I lived in Morocco for three years, and and there the. Party for Justice and Development, which is the main Islamist party that is accepted and, and runs in elections, um, they were very active. They were very active in grassroots organizing, both on ch charity level and also political level. Um, and they really earned the respect of people through a lot of their, their actions. But they also benefited from a bit of a, um, a trend in, towards being an Islamist. You know, there was, it was sort of a popular movement, sort of how Pan-Arabism was back in the 70s. You know, it was, it, it's sort of a, a popular thing. Fashionable. Yeah, it's, a, it's in fashion, if, yeah, exactly. Um, and so, yeah, I, and I think that is true in other places across the region. So in Tunisia in particular, the Islamist party did very well. Um, they were, because of the way that the lists were set up, um, man, woman, man, woman, and that was, their party was one of the only parties that got several seats off of any given list. They have um, almost all of the seats in parliament that are um, represented by women mm. are Islamist women, because they were the only ones that, that got several seats on their list elected. Um, so they do have a very, very strong role within the, the new government, as does the PJD in, in Morocco. And I think this is a chance and an opportunity both for the Western world and the U.S. government to interact with an Islamist government and understand whether or not it's something that they can accept vis-a-vis -vis Hamas in 2006. Um, and in, in the West Bank Gaza elections where they rejected working with an Islamist government on other bases, not just because it's Islamist, but um, you know, I, I think it will be interesting to see once they're now in a position where they have to be accountable, whether or not that will, will keep going and how that, how that will go. No, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a very interesting and timely for Americans are debating the role of religion in our own politics, for heaven's sakes, during this whole primary season. So um, we can't ignore the fact that this is an important uh, dimension to, to, to our political, social, and cultural life, democracy, <coughs> should be um, without any hyphenated uh, in an ideal world. But Christian Democrats have been active in parties uh, in Europe and, and Islamic mm -hmm. Democrats may be emerging in the greater Middle East. What about the youth that have been so much in prominence when Herrera and I were in Tahrir Square 
um, a, a year ago. Uh, you're right, Herrera, there was, there was an effort to sort of be inclusive and, and, and to say, look, we, we want to have our faith, but that's ours to choose for. The state must be inclusive, Con constitution, the standards that Avery talks about. Um, did you see the youth playing a, a instrumental role in, um, in Tunisia? And Avery might say a word about the, you know, the e Egypt is full of unemployed, educated, what, uh, a third of the population is 15 years or younger. So these are young, dynamic societies that have been repressed for a long time. Are these youth going to balance the um, religious impulse of their fathers and, and mothers and uh, their own youth culture of being socially networked? Give us a little flavor of the, of the young people in, in Tunisia. Sure. Um, I think they, they very much were a part of the revolution, and particularly Tunisia also has a very young population. Um, and a significant portion of the population had never known anyone other than Ben Ali being um, president. So that in, its, in and of itself is fairly significant. Um, you know, I, I think they're, the youth, and particularly if they're unemployed and educated, then they have, any, have taken on an even stronger role, and probably also in Egypt, because mm -hmm. they're, they're, they have less to lose in terms of getting out in the street and demonstrating, um, and more to be upset about in that they can't uh, you know, they've worked so hard in school and to try and do well and get ahead and then to graduate and be unemployed and frustrated. And more time if you're unemployed. Sure, exactly. To sit in Tahrir or someplace and protest. Yes, so I, I think that was a significant part about it. Um, you know, and then, of course, they are also the ones who are on Facebook and who are on mm -hmm. um, the social media and have that facility of making those connections with other people. Um, when I was in uh, West Bank, Gaza last year, I was talking with some of the uh, people in our office and, and a few of the activists who had been out in, in Palestine demonstrating, and one of the things that they said to me was, oh, well, yeah, we got in touch with some Tunisians on Facebook, and they're, telling, they're giving us some hints as to how to do this and mm -hmm. how to do that. Yeah, and it's just amazing the way that it has brought people together, and it's something that yeah, you know, the older generation knows a little bit, you know, knows some of and is sort of connected via email and things like that now, but not as much in terms of um, Facebook and Twitter and those, mm -hmm. the, the social media that um, helped to, to really snowball the revolution. Not start it necessarily, but to definitely just snowball it. Politics has become alive. I mean, politics <laughs> is now seen as the key to prosperity, and, and for so long it was thought that, well, if you just got the economic policies right, you didn't have to have political liberalism. That's the hopeful sign, yes? I mean, the, 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 the reversibility of these issues, the Carter Center has worked in a lot of places where you've had an election and it reverted afterwards. If, if you look across the region, what, what would you see is a, is a virtuous circle as opposed to a vicious circle that has characterized politics in that part of the world for so many years, the vicious circle of, of, of another oligarchy emerging, a, a, another Mubarak coming out of the Egyptian turmoil as happened after Nasser died, or indeed after the British pulled out, after colonialism ended, after the Ottoman Empire ended. It's always been a, a consolidation around an extractive elite rather than an opening for an inclusive, and it's the key to economic development, prosperous, more democratic. What, what would be your, your preferred scenario? Well, I, you know, I, I think, and, th and thank God this is true, that, I, that a lot of people saw the power of what one or a few people or several people could do together. Mm -hmm. And that is uh, definitely a positive change mm -hmm. in the region. And I, I think that will, um, as their political institutions become more mature, that there will be a very good interaction between an elected government and civil society and people understanding that now in a, a much more concrete way what sort of difference that they can make in, in terms of advocating for their rights. And that is, that is, I think, something very positive. In order for all of this to go very smoothly, they're still, you know, they're, they're still very much in the middle of the transition. Mm -hmm. And as Avery alluded to earlier, in Egypt, no one really knows exactly how things are gonna turn out. Um, in Tunisia, it's, the current status is that the Constituent Assembly is drafting a constitution. And they had said at the beginning that it would take them about a year and then they would have a referendum on the Constitution. And that, those dates are slipping a little bit. 
um, because they're discovering that it's not so easy because they also need to legislate at the same time as work on a constitution, but then they also need to be respon responsive to their constituents, and they need to get back out to the field and tell people what's happening. And so then they end up, and if you add up how they've divided their time in the constituent assembly, you see that they really only have about eight days a month that have been slated for working on the constitution because they have another eight days of, eight or nine days of legislating. They've got one day off per week. They've got seven days out in the districts to tell people what they've been doing. And you know, it's not, it, it's just, they're finding it difficult to juggle. It took our things. founders 12 years from the Revolutionary War to getting a constitution. So it's not an easy process. Yes, well in, in Egypt and in Libya, they're trying to write a constitution very, very quickly. A very so. condensed timeline, yeah. Beyond uh, writing the Constitution, um, all of these processes are still uh, incomplete. Mm -hmm. um, it would take a long time uh, to get where we'd like to see them uh, uh, get. But this is generating enormous frustrations among those, the young people yes. who started the revolution, among women who are on the forefront of the revolution in particular in Egypt, where it seems, um, to them at least, it seems, that the revolution has been hijacked by an old political movement, mm -hmm. political Islam. And they're frustrated, yet they have not been able to organize themselves in such a way as they could take advantage of the momentum they built during the revolution up until just the, up until the elections, actually, a year into the revolution. They were not able to organize themselves in political parties and campaigns to take advantage of the momentums they built and move forward. Now, this is one aspect of it. Another aspect is that not all not all of Egypt is Cairo, and not all of Cairo is Tahrir Square. What we saw in Tahrir Square, with all due respect to the hundreds of thousands, a million at times, people who came out, and in some of the other uh, cities, the rest of Egypt was in dire situation of poverty, and the situation has not changed for them. In fact, it has gotten it has deteriorated. So that has had an impact on the way in which these people have voted. I mean, all of these countries that have gone through these upheavals in the last year have lost enormous amounts of funds, funding, economy, etc., aggravating already a very difficult unemployment situation for the young. Again, as we were saying, 60% uh, of the population in many of these countries are under 30, and a huge number of those are unemployed. Add to this, this the economic difficulties created in the last year. Egypt alone has lost about $25 billion in foreign reserves in the last year because of withdrawal of direct uh, foreign investments and close, closure of factories, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, tourists uh, staying away in most cases. We, we need to get to questions fairly soon, but I, I can't resist one more <clears throat> round of, of, of comment on uh, the role of external actors. We know that these are locally driven processes, but uh, is there a way for the uh, U.S. government not to do harm and, in fact, do some good. Tom Friedman had a column a couple of weeks ago saying, let's cut our military billion-dollar automatic aid to the military and in, in, in Egypt and make it available for projects of social entrepreneurship, <clears throat> for example. Um, would, you, would either any of you like to comment a little bit on, on the role of the U.S., the international community, in support of the processes, which I think we'd all like to see uh, take hold? Is there anything that we can do other than... Uh, then watch from the sidelines? I think Egypt um, has been an interesting example of, of how the U.S. can or cannot uh, assist in the process of this transition. 
I'm sure we've all read the news articles about the uh, NGO uh, workers who were deported or had to leave because they're facing trial in, in Egypt for helping uh, human rights and democracy groups and training political parties. You might add the Carter Center turned down any possibility of yes. American we funding. We do not receive American U.S. funding in Egypt. Um, so that's been helpful. Um, you know, the Egyptians are, are very, very proud and feel that they do not need any help whatsoever from anyone ever, anytime, any place. Um, so this process of the transition and, and these elections has been one um, that has been a learning process for, I think, many uh, governments in the international community, but also the Egyptians. Um, it has been a process where everyone has had to really um, understand how delicate, delicate these negotiations about democracy have to be. Um, we have seen that some donors are a little bit better at that than others. Um, but I think that it's a long process. And I think slowly over time when there is um, more evidence of the good that can come from assistance from the international community, there will be more willingness to accept it. And I think mm -hmm. we're slowly seeing that. The Carter Center has done, done a lot of um, advocacy for uh, the for international assistance in the field of elections and democracy promotion. There's still a lot to be done, but we're seeing the tide is slowly turning in Egypt, and I think there's an understanding that, that assistance doesn't mean interference and that there's a lot that you can gain from, from seeking advice from people outside of your, your boundaries. That's Egypt, but of course, yeah, Sarah, I mean, Libya, we had NATO, and in Tunisia, we have the Europeans. True. Yeah. Uh, well, and in, in Libya, actually, most of the people that I met were very happy to see Americans, British, and French, um, and very thankful to them for the help that they had received from, from NATO, and, and in many cases, in certain specific instances where they felt that even their, their lives were saved because the Gaddafi militias were two kilometers away and advancing in, and the only thing that saved them was, was NATO. So that actually was quite, quite interesting. Um, I think one thing that is very, very interesting to note in all of the countries that we work in is that across the board, um, <coughs> even though sometimes the US government is not very well perceived or think people have a, um, a, a slight suspicion that they that they have some other atten intentions, or you know that, that they do not, you know they they don't appreciate them getting involved always, or accepting their money, or accepting their advice, or any of, of anything like that, because they're a bit suspicious of what what angle they're going for. Um, I've been very very pleasantly surprised and very um, very grateful, I guess, for the reputation that President Carter enjoys in the region. Mm -hmm. And that across the board, in every country that I've been to, they've said, you know, well, we don't like American policy on this. And, this. and yes, President Carter is a former president, but oh, we really like President Carter. <laughs> and that, I think, has been really quite um, amazing to see. They are, are all very familiar with his human rights record and his um, his pushing for human rights consistently since his administration across the world, particularly in the Arab region. And that has been a, a determining factor in whether or not the different governments <coughs> and civil society organizations have been willing to work with us. And so even groups like Inada, the, the party that's now in government <coughs> in Tunisia, had talking points when they came to see me. And they went through their three or four talking points about how they didn't like US position on XYZ. Um, then they got to the end and they said, well, OK, we know all that, but we really do like President Carter. And we, we're, we would very much welcome your presence here. So that has been quite, quite an experience. And, um, and I'm very thankful for that. Well, that was a wonderful, heartwarming uh, uh, a comment. Uh, it reminds me when I was thinking about leaving South Africa to come here, Archbishop Tutu said, don't go back to the United States, but the Carter Center is OK. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and it, 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 uh, it, it, it's, it seems, I'm looking at the clock, that if we've got questions in the audience, I have about 20 that I didn't get to ask. Would you please step up to the microphone and let's see what kind of uh, a brainstorming we can have with your, uh, with your input. Uh, no statements, please. If you can keep to a question, that would be really helpful. And you can direct it to any of 
my colleagues. <laughs> Why don't I start right here and then we'll go back to the other side. Uh, my name is John Lovett. I'm curious about the uh, impact of other, uh, other foreign powers in the region, in particular China, and if they have a presence and if that's having an impact. Take that one in Syria. Why don't you have a word about Turkey? Throw in Turkey all at the same time in Iran. I mean, the most obvious uh, uh, place to talk about the influence of um, uh, foreign powers is uh, uh, Syria. Uh, unfortunately, if I were to, uh, to summarize the influence of uh, foreign powers in Syria, I would say the influence has been very negative. Very negative. Uh, on the one side, you have um, uh, countries in the region uh, uh, and uh, uh, beyond that have been pushing the opposition in Syria towards uh, uh, intransigence. And you have countries, uh, Russia, China, uh, and a few others, um, uh, that have been pushing the regime towards uh, intransigence and to stand its ground and not to give in to uh, uh, demands for reform uh, in the country. So um, there the influence of foreign powers has been very uh, negative. In Egypt, perhaps uh, somebody else can comment or Tunisia? <laughs> um, I mean, I, th I think as I said, you know, the, in Egypt, I think other foreign powers would like to have more influence than perhaps uh, they, are, they are allowed. Certainly, um, there has been um, some uh, interest in, in assisting in this, this transition process and, and having the transition perhaps you know, at least be peaceful perhaps, and make sure that it's a, it's a government who will, uh, at the end of the day, uh, be peaceful towards Israel. Um, this is, uh, I think, at, at the forefront of many people's minds when they're thinking about the future of this transition in Egypt. So will Camp David be um, upheld? Will there be uh, an issue with another uh, sort of state, neighboring state with Israel who has potentially uh, on the brink of conflict with them? So there definitely is, is influence, but it's maybe more subtle in Egypt in part because the Egyptians themselves are, are less open to having very uh, open influence. Perhaps I should mention also Iran. Yes, indeed. Uh, if, I, if I have a couple more minutes. Yes. Uh, during the beginning months of the Arab uprisings, uh, Iran tried to take advantage and insert itself in a position of influence with the revolutionary forces or the forces that were pressing for the changes in those uh, uh, countries. Um, and their motivation at the time, the Iranian motivation at the time, was to undermine the ruling regimes of the countries in which some of the uprisings were taking place and who were pro-Western regimes. Mubarak is one example, and uh, others uh, as well. But very quickly, that policy came back to bite itself, uh, bite Iran, because the Iranians started saying, wait a second, if these revolutions are good enough, the democratic transformation is good enough for Egypt, Tunisia, uh, uh, Libya, and some of the uh, other places, what about Iran? Shouldn't we be also uh, um, experiencing the same kind of democratic change in Iran? Immediately, Iran changed uh, policy, withdrew any support from uh, uh, the revolutions, but started supporting, continued rather, I should say, not started, but continued to support some of its allies in, uh, uh, in the region based on Sunni-Shia divide, again. And prime example where the Iranians came down very hard in support of the regime was in Syria, in Bahrain as well. Uh, not, no, not in Bahrain, I'm sorry. Bahrain, they, were, they continued to support the opposition forces. But in Syria, uh, uh, Iran continues to this, to this day to support financially, uh, militarily, and diplomatically the Assad uh, regime. Thank you. Yes, please, over here. Hi, my name is Mazen Aspahi from Chicago. Um, my question is uh, a little bit more technical related to elections and uh, registration. Um, your discussion reminded me of a 
great article that an old professor of mine wrote on 10 mistakes that um, uh, Arab, new Arab democracies can learn from America about democracy. And a couple of those ideas were stuff like compulsory voting or holding the election on a day off as opposed to a day where people need to work uh, or automatic registration. Uh, some of these, and then obviously the television commercials and its influence uh, in the uh, election process. So my question is, when the Carter Center is working with other NGOs in helping facilitate these transitions, how are you basing the recommendations? Are they, are they building off of what we see in our democracy here, or are they starting from the beginning? Thank you. We love questions about our work. Um, so the Carter Center starting point for any recommendations that we make are the international commitments to which John referred earlier, sort of quite high-level commitments that we find in international human rights treaties like the International Covenant on Civil and Political Right that says that you have the right to vote by secret ballot in periodic <clears throat> and genuine elections. So we take that as our starting point. One of the things that we do as election observers is look not only at the practices on election day, at voting and counting and, and tabulation of votes, but we look at the framework for the election, the legal framework, what provisions are in place, for example, for overseas voters to cast their ballots, <coughs> is there compulsory voting, et cetera. And we think about that in the context of these high-level obligations, human rights obligations, which are absolutely fundamental. But we also try and think about the particular country context. So for example, in Egypt, there is compulsory voting. Um, there is a fine that will be, is supposed to be uh, enforced on voters who don't vote, and it's quite a high fine. So actually, in the context of Egypt, the Carter Center has, has, says and feels that compulsory voting is, is fine, but that there shouldn't be this fine that's completely um, sort of penalizes people uh, in, a, in an unjust way because it's something like close to $100 for not voting. Very high for many people. That's a huge fine. And also the fine isn't enforced. So then you have a law on the books that's not enforced and that, that's not good practice in general. So we, we try and think about the specific context and how it impacts the lives of voters in the country as well as how it relates to the international obligations of the country. Let me stay on this side just because you've been standing a long time and then we'll go over there. Yes, please. Uh, I'm Dave Freeman and I'm not a foreign policy expert. Uh, I have a question to probably the most modest panel I've ever encountered. Uh, Jimmy Carter is loved in the Middle East. Uh, tell us a whole lot more about how you're using that influence and what you're doing when you're over there uh, other than just the bland comment of observing elections. We're, we're here to hear about what you guys have been doing, so please tell us more. Sarah, why don't you begin, because you've just run a big mission and you're getting another one organized, so, and then Avery and Harir. Sure, um, well, over, over the last couple of years, I've, I've had the opportunity to be working in Sudan, uh, where the Carter Center and President Carter has been active for over 25 years, um, and then in Tunisia and, um, West Bank, Gaza, um, and now now Libya. So I think in all of those places, um, you're right, President Carter is very loved. Um, and he, you know, across the board, no matter where we go, it does open a lot of doors for us as well in terms of um, being when able- When you get inside the door, what do you do? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, in terms of our, our work, I think the, one of the key things of, of being an observer and, have, and deploying observers in a country for an election mission is being able to talk to a very diverse group of people and, and representatives of political parties, the government, civil society, um, many of the, the, the people who are most, you know, the, the people, that, the voters themselves, but also the, the election commission and, and others who are very, um, uh, who are who interact with the elections and who who have a big role to play in the elections, and in our discussions with them, we are trying to find out how things are going, what their perception of the process is, um, what of the what are the challenges that they're facing in terms of participating in the elections, 
if the, as Avery was saying before, if the legal framework for the elections is being respected. And then um, we also deploy observers across the country, and those observers uh, typically go to very small rural places as well as larger urban areas and also talk, try to talk to people on a very local level to understand better how the process is going and, and whether or not people are able to participate freely, if candidates are able to campaign freely, and whether or not the political process is, is open and would provide for a, a genuine election and that everyone has the opportunity to participate in the election and cast a ballot for the candidate of their choice in a secret way and be able to um, to fully participate in the civic affairs and political affairs of their country. So in order to do that, you have to establish a very good rapport with people and to really understand and, and be open. They have to be open to you being there and you to open to, to understanding what their positions are, um, whether they're critical or, um, or positive. And, and then we gather all of that and assess how the process is going and put forth recommendations. But the recommendations, and I think this is a key point in it, is that they will not implement the recommendations <laughs> unless they have respect for the institution that's making them and um, see that their comments and insights into the process have been taken into account when we make those recommendations. So I, I think the very um, idea that it, the Carter Center has such a good reputation and President Carter has such a good reputation really allows us to make recommendations that will be taken into consideration and hopefully um, used in further reform of their electoral laws and, and help to produce a stronger process and, and more genuine, transparent, and accountable institutions. And I, I don't think we could do that unless we had um, the positive reputation that we do enjoy in the Middle East. I, I just would, 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 it's a very good question, and Sarah gave a very good answer from an operational standpoint. Uh, I'll, I'll be talking a little bit about this tomorrow, but the, the example that President Carter sets is, is worth pondering. Uh, why is he beloved? For one reason, he's a man of great devotion, and people respect him for being a man of the book while at the same time being completely open to listening to other people's points of views without imposing his own. He's the most low maintenance leader of, 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 of the most powerful country in the world, for heaven's sakes, uh, that I've ever encountered. And so consequently, he doesn't talk down to anybody. He, he, he conveys a sense that they're respected, and that's crucial. We learn a lot from his example, and we are challenged to carry that example forward uh, into the future. That's, the, as Sarah said, the, the, the secret of the Carter Center's success is being a good partner. Uh, <coughs> John Hardman often points out that um, Global 2000 was named Global 2000 so that it wouldn't allow for some local ownership. Um, in these sensitive areas, local ownership and giving a, 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 an audience and holding out the possibility that they won't be forgotten, that their voice will resonate. And the Carter Center sitting here in Atlanta can amplify credible voices from the field, and that's a draw for getting us as partners. But we have to be very careful. If, so, if I could just ask a follow, is part of your success that you do not publicly talk about recommendations that you've made that are accepted so as not to embarrass the the, the, the government? Is that part of your... No, the, the, that's a very, another very good question, and, and it, it, it's particularly uh, appropriate for, for an experience I just had in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, because we were um, the most prominent voice on questioning the credibility of that election, but we could do it from a data-driven, evidence-based argument, because we are professionals as much as we can be in very, very difficult circumstances and we could present a documentation that suggested why we could not accept the results as being credible. And knowing how to render that judgment and to render it in a way that resonates is what gives you some uh, influence at a time, and this is a very big point because I've been watching international affairs for an awful long time, and the uh, consensus that has emerged in the aftermath of the Cold War that people ought to be given the, the voice that the 
sacred um, documentation like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the UN Charter that people have paid homage to rhetorically for so long, <coughs> Avery's business, is now resonating um, because there is no uh, alternative thought than the dignity of individuals. It's, it's, it's remarkable. There is a, I won't belabor this, but there's a new um, uh, uh, volume out by, uh, by Moyen at Columbia, Stephen Moyen at Columbia, The Last Utopia, that cites Jimmy Carter's evidence of, of, of work on human rights as the starting point in the post-Cold War, post-socialist, post-fascist world to, to recognize that one thing that holds us together as, as humanity is a respect for the rights of the individual to exercise the franchise. So all these countries say they believe in elections. And our job is to come in and, and be credible in judging whether or not they've done a fair job. Yes. Uh, yeah, my name is Andrew Ramsey. I come from Scotland in the United Kingdom. Scotland, uh, are you succeeding? Seceding? Uh, very possibly. We'll find out in a couple of years' time. Uh, <laughs> uh, that would be an observation that would be fun to do. Yeah, exactly. That would yeah, be yeah. a change from Libya. Can I come? <laughs> uh, the first point that I think Harir, apologize if I mispronounced your name, uh, made in the discussion was that we should remember that the, the scale of this uprising is so vast. I was just wondering if there are any particular difficulties perhaps that one might not immediately think about for the Carter Center working in an area where there's so much going on and it's, it being so vast and or are there any stories or developments in the area that might not be getting reported on as much as they should be? Well, I, I think the, 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 one of the dangers, I guess, in, in terms of, of working across the region, and um, you know, that because it is so vast and, and even the, the socioeconomic indicators are so different from country to country, that you have to really try and, and, and take a very um, start Modest. each mission with a, with a clean slate in terms of what your perceptions are and what you think is happening in the country. And you know, we were talking about the differences between Tunisia, Algeria, Libya, Egypt, Syria earlier, but really the, you know, the, the Arab world is, is so diverse that you can draw parallels between the different countries and what's happening and this versus that, but it's, it's very dangerous to think that you know exactly what's going on without really spending a significant amount of time working in the country. And you know, a prime example for me is Algeria in that I've been working on Tunisia now for a year and a half. I lived in Morocco for three years, and in between is Algeria, which I had not visited, but thought that I knew more about. And when I visited, you know, it's sort of that thing where you, for the first few days, you think you're really getting it, you know, and you understand, and you're a complete expert, and then after the fifth day, you understand that you don't really know very much at all, because you've discovered just enough to know that you don't know what's going on. So, you know, it's a tricky thing in terms of um, really trying to not make assumptions about things and to really un try and understand and not have preconceptions as to what, what is happening. So that, that was one of the more difficult things that I think I've had to just adjust to in terms of working across the region, that um, the language may or may not be similar. Sometimes it's not, because there's many different dialects in Arabic. And the, um, the habits may be very similar, but the, the politics themselves, even though they may appear sometimes very similar, are actually have much different foundations underneath them. So, I mean, The one thing I can add to what Sarah has uh, just uh, said is that a lot of the times the Western media um, tends to oversimplify uh, uh, things um, in this uh, Arab Revolution in general, but in particular since mm -hmm. we're talking about the Arab Re Re Revolution uh, in this uh, case, and tends to uh, present things in stark black and white extremes and nothing in between. Uh, and a good example is uh, Syria, where what we read every day, what we uh, hear on television every day, even some of the more informed uh, uh, media tell us that there is this regime on the one hand and then there's this opposition who wants to fight against the regime and 
and can, uh, uh, to, uh, to defeat the regime, and we should be supporting the uh, uh, opposition. They tend to ignore an enormous middle uh, between these two extremes, also opposition, which advocate reforms, radical reforms in uh, Syria, but they advocate the reforms to political <coughs> processes. They are not happy to see the, the increasing militarization of the opposition on the one hand, and obviously the increasing repression from uh, uh, the regime side. And they include, I would say, the majority of the people who are going out on the streets on a daily basis, every weekend, every Friday, to protest. The local people, the youth, who are caught in between this extreme militarization on the opposition side and the repression from the, the, uh, the regime side, yet courageously are out there protesting and demanding a, a, a transition, a reform process, a political dialogue as Kofi Annan has been trying to, uh, to, to start. So, I mean, that's one lost story uh, in the daily media that we see well, and, uh, and, here. And, 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 and just to follow this, just one step further, because it gets back to the modesty of the Carter Center is, and its role and its importance. Um, Herrera is referring to what's left of the traditional media. We know that foreign correspondents are in very short supply these yep. days for budget constraints. At the same time, the subtleties that my colleagues are struggling with hardly gets reflected in a 140 <coughs> character tweet. And we are inundated with an outpouring of highly partisan social networking that completely overloads the networks with information that may or may not be valid or even true at any sense. Mm -hmm. And so the Carter Center becomes a, a, I hope, a kind of a, a lens through which uh, the, the, the basic principles that underlie what we do as hum, human beings belonging to the United Nations pledge at some level allegiance to, this gets back to Avery's work, and it provides a framework so that when, when media call me, I can refer them to what we are th thinking is a reasonable process that is credible or not, and I can give reasons. And there seems to be a very real need for that informed judgment about a limited set of questions that are key to getting a process sustained. What Herrera's describing is only gonna work if it's in a process that is not violent and can be cumulative and sustained. And if we are bearing witness and can do that in a credible, clear way, it may lower the temperature, cut out some of the static, and let's see a way forward. We're, we're doing a bit more than bearing witness in the case of Syria. In the case of uh, Syria, yes. Uh, in December, when, uh, when we were in Syria on another trip, uh, we, in discussing with the government, the opposition, and the international community in Syria, we do, developed an idea that we thought could be helpful in launching a political process uh, in the country. And we presented this idea to the government ministers, two ministers that uh, uh, we met with. And they also thought it was a viable idea. And by the way, I should say that the Carter Center <coughs> is the only international non-governmental organization still given visas to visit Syria. We're the only ones. And, and the last visit was just last week, as John mentioned earlier. So we presented this proposal to the government and the opposition. And the, 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 the crux of the proposal was that we would take a look at what the government is doing in terms of the very, very inadequate reforms that they had already put in place or they were in the process of putting in place. Talk with the government uh, to see what additional reforms they were willing to, they could live with. Go back to the opposition and when you talk about the opposition in Syria, there's not, there's not a single opposition. They're extremely fragmented. So talk with various groups in the opposition and see what their ideas uh, were in terms of reforms that they could live with. And, and I'm talking about the opposition that did not advocate, were not advocating uh, uh, militarization of uh, the process. And then eventually, hopefully, be able to develop a package 
that both sides would not be happy with, but perhaps could live with. The minister uh, with whom we were uh, um, discussing this uh, thought this was a very good idea, and in particular that it was coming from a Carter Center that she thought, and this was her word, we know Carter Center is not up to undermine the Syrian uh, uh, government. Um, and promised to come back to us with additional uh, information and then to start the process with us. But obviously, she was not able to convince the person above him, above her, and nothing came out of it. But this time when we went back, we pursued this idea further, both again with the government and the opposition, and we found reception on the opposition, but not so much on the government side uh, this time. So we may uh, follow up with the opposition uh, on this uh, uh, idea. Thank you. In that process, he answered a question from the webcast, uh, uh, um, Tarek uh, uh, Sely. So, so thank oh, you. You okay. answered two questions with that. <laughs> Can I please uh, have a question here? <coughs> I believe I have a quick question with a quick answer. About how many people does it take to observe an election? Well, it depends on the size of the country. Good answer. <laughs> That's the quick between, answer. Between small to large, just, you know, approximately. So, I'm just curious. Um, I think the smallest election observation mission, well, there, I think there's a tie for two. Sure. Yeah, two. Uh, the smallest election observation mission that we have deployed that we considered to be comprehensive, where we're looking not just at election day, but at all the structural issues. Um, the smallest one was either East Timor, because it's a very tiny country, or the Cherokee Nation when we observed just this last fall in Oklahoma, where we managed to hit 100% of the polling stations with 12 people, which was a record. <laughs> uh, I think our largest These missions- These are Cherokee Indians. <laughs> yes, our largest mission was probably Sudan. Sudan. Huge, used to be the biggest country in Africa when it was one. The one biggest mission. Yes. Yeah. It, was the, it was the biggest country in Africa before it split into two, and we, uh, we still felt like we were not very, you know, not as well covered as we wanted to be. Um, but our mission for the referendum of, for the uh, independence of South Sudan was, um, there was voting both in, north, in, in the north in Sudan, but also in South Sudan, and also in overseas voting countries in eight different locations. So we had um, about 125 people accredited who were um, in the various locations, um, but I think we had I think we had over 120 who were in Sudan, and then another 30 or so who were in the overseas voting locations, and then those people it, the election was over seven days, so they they traveled around the country in their specific area of responsibility for seven days before coming back to well. So, actually about 10 days because they watched the balloting and then also the, the counting of the ballots and everything before they came back to Juba. So yep. quite a number. That was a terrific question because one of the things that really keeps us up at night with our donors is they're always trying to squeeze our budgets. And how many can you deploy to be credible? It is a really serious question. And I must say that one of the exciting things about the election business and the example that the Carter Center sets in terms of the quality of doing serious impartial observing is that you're getting domestic organizations that are now rallying to this cause around the world. And in the case of the Congo, which is a vast country, 60,000 under the Catholic Church deployed as domestic observers. The question there is, are they doing a credible job? Are they sticking to the principles? The Carter Center pioneered electoral principles under the UN um, uh, auspices umbrella that sort of set guidelines for how you just on the day conduct it. That's apart from the election standards, Avery, right? But um, these are very, very important <coughs> questions because they have budget impacts on everything we do. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I'm Krista Binney from Tucson, Arizona. You've mentioned that women were at the forefront of many of these movements, and I'm wondering if you could discuss some of the positive and, and maybe negative effects of the role that they play. Um, well, I think in, in Tunisia, I could say that they were definitely involved in the, the demonstrations and um, out and um, out in the streets as, as in equal numbers, um, and perhaps even more so. They turned out in greater numbers to, in, in registration and in voting. Um, and then 
for the first time they've been more included in, in Parliament. I think 27% of the, the Parliament in Tunisia, or the Constituent Assembly, is, is female. And that was because there were several people, um, several organizations and political parties that were involved in drafting the new electoral code. And the women who had been very active as um, human rights activists and, and democracy defenders, human rights defenders, were, were very much um, pushing for more women's representation in the institutions. And they were involved in helping to write the, the code. And there was a, uh, several significant um, activists who were who are women in Tunisia. Um, and they established an, a new electoral code whereby on the party lists for the elections, every other position is a woman. And so if a list got more than one person elected, then you would have um, automatically that list would have a, a woman elected into parliament. So that was significant, um, but it did not result in what they wanted, which was half of the parliament to be women. And so now Libya is looking at a similar situation in terms of writing their electoral code and how things should happen. And they have an electoral code now, and it does not have a gender quota because I think it, it had in initial drafts a gender quota of 10%, and people thought it was too low. So they, um, uh, they, took that, they took the quota out because they were upset that it was too low, and now they're going at it from a regulatory standpoint in terms of the party list that they have to have women on the list. But not only do you have to have either man, woman, man, woman, you also have to be woman, man, woman, man, so that a woman is at the top of the list in some of the constituencies, or half of the constituencies where you're running a list. Mm -hmm. So uh, they're really hoping for and aiming for uh, 100 women in the constituent assembly of 200, and um, really aiming to have um, very good representation. Uh, on the downsides, I think the, um, the there's not a negative of their participation. It's more a negative of um, not as much participation as even some of the men would have liked in terms of the women's representation and how it turned out, how the list turned out in Tunisia. Egypt is. Egypt, yeah. yes, is similar in some ways in that women were definitely at the, the forefront of the revolution and were very active in Tahrir and you know, really were very brave, particularly for some of these young women who were not only sort of out in these protests but were confronting social norms about whether or not they should be participating in this process at all. So we saw these, these wonderful human rights defenders who were out there protesting and very much sort of at the forefront of this change. However, once the sort of immediate protests simmered down and the sort of political system snapped into place, as Herrera was alluding to with, with the way that the political parties were then able to sort of take over, the same thing happened with the election law. They had gotten rid of the quota for women, so parties then weren't really obliged to have women uh, be ac actually elected. They had to have women on their list, but it didn't mean that they had to be the people that were sitting in parliament. So we see a parliament with very few women uh, in it, and then this is also sort of translated into this process of constitution drafting because the parliament in Egypt was, uh, is supposed to, was going to have to re-select re members of a constituent assembly who will draft this constitution. And uh, in the initial const constituent assembly, there were six of a, women out of 100 members. And so it's just not represented really at all. And now that constituent assembly has been disbanded. They'll be reforming constituent assembly it's not clear what role women will play in that body at all. It's an, I don't feel particularly optimistic, unfortunately. We can hope that it'll be more than six, but when we were there last week and we were talking to people about this, the common response was, well, you know, maybe if a woman is also a member of a trade union or some other organization that has to be represented, we'll have a woman, but we're not going to have women just to have women. <laughs> Which, in the context of Egypt, is, you know, a country of its size is terrible. It's at this pivotal moment in its history. But it seems to be, I think many people think that this is also sort of a response to Mubarak, um, particularly Suzanne Mubarak's role in women's rights issues in Egypt, that she was really a leader for women's rights issues in Egypt, and this is a response to, to, to the Mubarak regime. And so people, when we ask them, they're just not that interested in continuing to promote women's rights. It's associated with her. Eh, they don't really feel strongly about it, which is tragic.
And when you say them, actually, usually them is, is, is a group of men. <laughs> because I just want to point out that in most of our meetings, um, and, and most recently in, in Libya and in Algeria, um, I very frequently would look around the room and discover that I was the only woman in the meeting, um, or maybe one other woman who was on our, our delegation in Algeria. And you know, so when you go and you meet with political parties or, or an election commission or government representatives, very frequently um, they are men. And, and if I ask them about the role of women within their organizations, they all kind of look around like, what? Are you oh, that? well, we have one. We can two. Call her in. Yeah, we, we, can, her. we can ask her to come if you want to talk to her. And, and so, yeah, the, it's, it's sometimes not very progressive in that sense in terms of who they uh, have. If, someone, if people are appointed to a position, they might not, or elected to a position, uh, women are not as... Uh, re well represented. Quite a question. Yes, please. I'm so glad that you uh, asked the question. You should ask that question about an hour ago, then we get them really wind up. See how <laughs> they were so quiet and kind of timid. But let's talk about women issue and right on you, you're showing the... S Sarah's not timid. <laughs> <laughs> Neither is it. My name is Steve Protoulos and I'm a strong supporter of the center. And I'm very proud of having this great panel. I really congratulate you for doing this. This is great uh, uh, information that we don't get in the n normal process. I have a million questions, but I'm going to narrow it down to one quickie. Maybe you don't have the answer, but are we still giving aid to Egypt from the United States of America, the $2 billion a year? OK. Yep. The answer yep. is yes. yes. Where does it go to? To the military? The military. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Oh, good. That's a question I kind of knew the answer, but I'm going to confirm it. My question is, on the basis of the Palestinian situation and the Israeli situation, and the media and the propaganda, the anti-American propaganda, every time it's an incident or something deal with Israel or Palestinians, how does that affect the U.S. involvement in trying to make this a fair approach to be more or less even towards us, or maybe at least be more in favor of us or against us. And the last question in this mumbo jumbo world, isn't the Russians playing a more effective role trying to more than ever before? On the Palestinian-Israeli uh, 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 issue, the Arab uh, revolutions of the last year uh, have not yet had a major impact, but it's coming. It's really coming. It's coming in a sense that up until a year ago, with the old regimes, pro-Western old uh, regimes, you had a situation where um, the Israeli-Palestinian <coughs> negotiations were going nowhere in the effort to create the two-state outcome, a Palestinian state in West Bank and Gaza, and of course, uh, uh, Israel. The negotiations under US auspices were going uh, nowhere. And the Arab states around Israel and Palestine were acquiescing, basically. They were going along. Once in a while, they would. Uh, make pro forma uh, protests, but not much more than that, really. Some, of course, Syria and a, a couple others uh, were more uh, forceful in their uh, protests, but by and large, you had a situation where the region acquiesced with this status quo of negotiations in impasse and facts on the ground settlements in uh, uh, the West Bank, creating facts on the ground that were basically sabotaging the two-state uh, solution that the entire international community had agreed to. Since the Arab uprisings of last year, I think the regimes or the governments, I shouldn't say regimes, but the governments uh, that are coming to power in those countries, in Egypt, Tunisia, Morocco, Libya soon, Syria, perhaps, once this uh, uh, war is, uh, um, uh, finishes. The governments in those countries will no longer be able to ignore their own people. Mm -hmm. 
the streets in the Arab countries have woken up. And that's where the Arab awakening comes, comes from. And they have discovered their power of demanding change through their own actions. At the beginning of the Arab revolutions, the Palestinian issue really did not feature much in the uh, street uh, protests. But say six months into the protests, they started coming into being. And you would see um, slogans and posters and signs and demands uh, about the Arab-Israeli situation, how unfair it was, etc., etc. So the governments coming to power will, ne will not be able to ignore the Arab masses and the Arab streets. And the Arab masses and the Arab streets are fed up with the situation of the Palestinians going underfoot repeatedly for decades and decades and decades and, and ending up at the losing end of things. So this, is, this will change in the next years, I think, in Arab-Israeli uh, uh, relations. And the sooner Israel and the West realize this, and the sooner they start dealing with this issue in a more, in a fairer way, the sooner we'll find a solution and the less upheaval and violence we would see uh, uh, in the region. President Carter has a piece in the Herald Tribune last week that talks about the two-state solution very much in that spirit. I'm getting signals from my control officer, Deborah Hakes, that we have to be on a schedule here, but we've got two people. If you want to each ask one sentence, Deborah, please don't shoot me. We will, um, <laughs> we will try to answer that, and I can thank everyone, but we really have to be punctual around here. Why don't I take a quick one question, and, and, and we won't answer it. We'll, we'll, we'll take both questions and then answer them together. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks to the panel for a very interesting evening. Uh, my name is Bob Storley. I'm from uh, St. Paul, Minnesota. And uh, as quick as I can ask it, I guess, uh, we have some power vacuums going on over in uh, some of these countries now. Um, well, Libya comes to mind, uh, perhaps Yemen. Um, what are the dangers of these hardcore anti-Western forces, such as in Al-Qaeda, are really create, creating havoc in uh, situations like that. Okay. And what's your question, ma'am? How specifically does the Carter Center go about prioritizing which countries they will put their <coughs> help to? And is the United States ever considered in that group? <laughs> is the U.S. We, 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 don't, we don't observe in the United States, as President Carter always says, with 50 separate electoral management bodies in all the states, it's a little hard for us to do it. He also was a, a, a partisan and still is a partisan, and we are impartial. So, you know, he is a Democratic president. Um, your, your question, though, about, and I won't ignore the other one, but the, the, the question about how we decide just bear in mind that the electoral priorities that the, Demo that the democracy program put forward in 2011, in January of 2011, had no mention of the very countries that you have just heard us <laughs> discussing over the course of this evening. If we cannot be quick responders when historic opportunities open within the framework of a, of a growing international consensus that every citizen has a right to a say on who governs them. Then if we don't have that flexibility, we're going to be behind the curve. <coughs> so we very carefully go through a survey, my colleagues in the democracy program, of all of the countries in the world that are having elections, and we try to pick those that are likely to be the most problematic, the most significant, uh, and the most in need of our help that others aren't doing. And we rank them, and President Carter looks at them, and all the other directors look at them, and we reach a conclusion. And then we take a deep breath and get on with it as best we can. Now, the kind of situation that the earlier questioner asked, I can't really get into at this stage in the evening, I'm afraid. It's a big one. But maybe we can pick that up tomorrow when we are discussing uh, other aspects of the Carter Center's work in these changing places around the world. 
Thank you ever so much for being here, the panelists. I'm so grateful to you, Sarah, for staying. Yes. Avery Herrera. Give an applause for yourself. You've been a terrific audience. Thank you very much, and we'll see you tomorrow.